got the um, microphone. Microphone. One already. Uh, let me see if there's a button on here. There you go. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Remember that hadith you gave up in the cook by mm -hmm. about Allah say I created a uh, man, son of Adam, I created you mm -hmm. for me and everything else for you. Mm -hmm. So don't busy yourself. What's after that? That's what part I missed. Not don't busy that. yourself with the things that I have created for you, for you. instead of the one whom I created you for. I think that was it. I didn't do it, but don't busy yourself with the things that I created for you, but busy yourself with the one that I created you for. Right, meaning himself. Yeah, I know. I lost the of time. I just did put it in the word I need help with this uh, Wi-Fi thing again. It's just, I don't know, it's not working out for me. I mean, it should automatically, yeah, they get a passport. That paper? No. I don't know. The email took it and did it. Let me see this Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Wa Salatu Wa Salam, Ala Ashraf Al Lambiyah, Wa Mursaleen, Wa Ala Alihi, Wa Ashabihi, Ajma'in. So, inshallah Ta'ala, um, our discussion this afternoon or this evening is going to be um, what has happened to the institution of marriage in the Islamic community. Uh, I'm going to say some things that's going to offend some people, but, um, you know, sorry, not sorry. It is what it is, man. It is what it is. When you get to a certain age, man, you just you just don't have the energy to be diplomatic anymore. You just, you just, you know what I mean? Like, you just say what it is. Like it who like it, don't like it who don't like it. You and your feelings, you get over it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you understand why... Our elders, like grandparents and things like that, like they just say whatever comes out of they they don't have no filter. They just say whatever they want to say. Right? Because when you get old, right, as you get older, you it took it takes too much energy to be diplomatic. Like you know, choosing sifting through your Rolodex, your vocabulary and choosing the right word. It just it just requires too much energy and you just don't have it like that because you're more concerned about the truth being given than you are about whether or not people are going to receive it in the best way or not. All right. So my my concentration is more so, you know, getting the truth out there than it is, you know, you being able to receive it. Because at the end of the day, some of us are just not mature enough to receive anything on a higher level. And when you you function at a certain certain frequency, right? You, you know, at a lower level of frequency, a lower level of consciousness, you're not going to accept any truth. The only truth that you accept is your own truth. When you function on a higher frequency of consciousness, you're open. You're open to truth in its many, many different manifestations. All right, so let me start by saying um, some of what I'm going to discuss tonight, I've, I've discussed in lectures before. It's, it's nothing new under the sun. Some of the stuff we've already touched on. Um, when we reflect on the institution of marriage in Islam, we see a divine system. This whole institution of marriage is a divine system that is designed to regulate the lusts of man. 
right? The Prophet Sallallahu told the young men in his community. He said, Ya ma'ashir al-shabab, man astata'a minkum al-ba'a falyatizawwaj, fa innahu aghadhu lil-basar wa ahsanu lil-farj, wa man lam yastati'a fa alayhi bisawm, fa innahu lahu wijah. He said, O group of young men, whoever from amongst you has the ability to get married, then let him do so. Because it is more likely to, able, to allow you to lower your gaze and to control your private area, to protect your chastity. Right? So marriage is a system that is divinely designed to help you regulate your lusts. The Prophet ﷺ said that if one of you goes out of his home and he sees in the street that which stimulates his desire, then let him go home to his wife because she has what the woman he just saw in the street has. She has the same exact thing. To regulate the desire, the lust. You guys follow me? Marriage is a divine, systematic institution that was designed to help man regulate his or her lust. More so than men. Women are not as lustful as men are. Maybe today because there's a new manufactured woman today, especially African American women, that has that's been designed, handcrafted by the society that we live in. Handcrafted by the, the society that we live in. So we're not talking about today's woman. We're talking about the woman in her original organic state as God created her. That's who we're talking about. That type of woman, her lusts are not like the lusts of man. Hence the fact the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the young men in the community to get married, and he never, he never encouraged the young women in the community to get married. Right? Because usually in those type of environments, uh, those type of social structures, um, their family dynamic will determine when the woman is ready to get married. No man can determine that for the woman. Right? No man outside a woman's family can de depict to her or determine for her when she's ready to get married. The family dynamic will determine that. All right? So the Prophet Wasallam spent a lot of his time encouraging the young men in the community because marriage, here again, is a divine system designed to regulate the lust of man. Regulate your lust. Not control, but regulate. Because marriage does not control your desire. Marriage does not control your lusts and desire. It helps you to regulate it. It helps you to weaken it. But it does not control. What controls the desire of man? I'm just stating this as a disclaimer. Because some men think that when I get married, I need to get married so I can learn how to control my desires. And then after you get married... Right? You still, those lusts and desires are still there. So then you want to go marry another wife. <laughs> because you believe when you marry the second wife, then you're going to make your lusts and desires just completely dormant. And then after you marry the second one, you realize that the desire is still there. The lust is still there. And then you marry another one. <laughs> Until you ultimately, if you're smart enough, you come to the realization that marriage does not control your desire. What controls your desire? The lust. What controls the lust and desire of man? Your fear of God. <laughs> the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ لَمُضْغَ إِذَا الصَّلَحَدْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ He said that in the body, there's a lump of flesh that if it is healthy, if it's sound, then the rest of the body will be healthy and sound. And if it is corrupt and unhealthy, then the rest of the body, including your private part, will be unhealthy and corrupt. That lump of flesh is where? The heart. That's what controls your lust and desires. You want to know what controls the lust and desire? It's the heart, not the private part. Feeding the desire... Right? Is hustling backwards. Feeding, giving in to the lust by marrying more women, 
right? You only feeding the lust, feeding the desire. That's not going to do anything but create more problems for you. That creates more problems for you. You guys follow me? So marriage is an institution that is designed to help you regulate your lusts and desire, not necessarily control them. The control part comes from the heart. When you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will dictate how far you go. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned in an authentic hadith, Kutiba ala kulli ibni Adam hadhahu min zina. That every child of Adam has his share or his portion of fornication written upon him. La mahala, there's no escaping that. He said, when you look with your eye, that is the zina, that is the fornication of the eye. When you listen with your ear, that is the fornication of the ear. He said, when you talk, that is the fornication of the tongue. He said, And your private part will either confirm it or reject it. That is directly connected to the heart. So, vain is the man who thinks that he's going to learn how to control his desire. The controlling of the desires through the heart, like it is with every other faculty that you have. Marriage is an institution that gives us uh, that, that feel, the maidan, where we can learn how to regulate our emotions, uh, our, our lusts and desires, as well as the plethora of emotions that are going to emerge from an intimate relationship between man and woman. What are some of the emotions that emerge when a man and a woman is in a relationship? We're talking about emotions, raw emotion. What are some of the emotions that emerge when a man and a woman is now put into this space of husband and wife? How many of you guys in here married? I'm, I'm talking to you guys. If you ain't married, then I'm not talking to you. You just sit and listen for moral support. You married, I'm talking to you. What are some of the emotions that emerge when you are in the same space with a woman or vice versa, a woman with a man. Sexual desire. Okay. Um, okay, love. Okay, we're talking about raw emotion. Sexual desire, it, it's an emotion, but it's, it's, it emanates from a different place. I'm talking about those emotions that emanate from the heart. Love, he said. What else? Fear. Fear. Fear doesn't emerge when you are in the same space with a woman. You're not in fear of losing her. You're not in fear of her, him walking away from you. Frustration. Frustration is a manifestation of fear. Uh-huh. Jealousy. Envy. Right? Women get jealous. Husband bring up taking a second wife. All those emotions, they just... They just begin to emerge from out your ears, out your eyes. They just come out from out of your pores. Anger, okay. Rage, all of these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ He says, in Surah al rum Surah number 30, Ayah 21, and we all know this Ayah because we all quote this Ayah at our marriages. Every time you go to a nikah, somebody's quoting this Ayah, right? We have it on our flyers, on our brochures, we're sending out, you know, messages for everybody to come to the nikah, and here is this magnificent Ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and from His sons, is that He created for you, from you, Spouses, mates, that you may find peace in them, right? And then he said, he placed between you love, mawadda, wa rahma, love and mercy. These are emotions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in this institution of marriage between man and woman. And indeed, and this is a sign for people who reflect. So that's love, that's mercy, compassion. Right, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La minha that no Muslim male should hate a Muslim female. But if you see something about her you dislike, 
then look again, you will find other things that you do like. So disliking is an emotion to dislike something about your spouse. But hatred is not something that should be factored in because a believing man should not ever hate a believing female. He said, but if you dislike something about her, and there's something even deeper, a deeper implication in this hadith, and that means that as husband and wife, we are not always going to like everything about our spouses. Some things I'm not going to like about you. And we have to learn how to be okay with that. My spouse hates the fact that I do this, or my spouse hates the fact that I do, or I hate the fact that she does this. That doesn't mean I dislike you as a person. That means that there are things about you that get underneath my skin. There are things about you that I don't like. Your sarcasm, I don't like it. Your nonchalant attitude about things that are important to me, I don't like it. The way you're constantly talking about, you know, the past relationships you've been in. I don't like that. There are things about our spouses that we're not going to like. And some people take this all or nothing attitude. Well, you know, if you married me, then you should love everything about me. That doesn't, <laughs> don't confuse me disliking a certain aspect of your character with me not loving the whole you. I love the whole you. But there are certain things about you that I don't like. And the Prophet Sallallahu is teaching us to balance those things with the things that we do like. That if you dislike one thing about her, then look again and you can find other things that you do like. And that will help you to balance that out. At least until you get mature. You become emotionally mature. And what do I mean when I say emotionally mature? You have a biological age and you have an emotional age. You have two ages. You have a biological age, how, are, how old you are biologically. And then you have how old you are emotionally. How well you do with the emotions that emerge from you and how you handle yourself and how you navigate through those emotions. You guys follow me? So you might in fact be 40 biologically. But emotionally, you might only be 12. You function like a little kid when it comes to your emotion, managing your emotions. You throw the baby out with the bath water. You want to fight. You want to, you know, every time you get in your feelings, you need an immediate solution, instant gratification because you're outside of your comfort zone. Right? So, you know, it's, in, it's important for us to understand, you know, where we are emotionally, our emotional age and versus our biological age. And one does not mean, uh, one does not equate with the other. Just because you're 40 biologically don't mean that you're 40 emotionally. Some of us have an arrested development. You know what that means? That means that at a particular point in our lives, we stop developing. We stop growing emotionally. We got stuck in a particular place, maybe at 15. We felt like we weren't validated, so we stay right there at 15. Even on into our 30s and 40s, we still 15. Because there's something about being 15 that just feels right. I enjoy my 15 years. When I was 15 years old, I enjoyed how I was treated or the lack thereof, I wasn't, I didn't get what I needed at 15, so at 30, I'm still trying to get at 30 what I should have got at 15. We're having a arrested, arrested development. Some of us, we have this delayed development, right? Prelonged adolescence. All of these things, man, they, you know, begin to emerge when you put us in a relationship with somebody. So when you all by yourself, you got it all figured out. The Prophet Wasallam, let me give you a hadith. The Prophet Wasallam, he said, I don't know anything that is more damaging to a rajal al-hazim, a man of strong resolve, a man of strong direction, know exactly where he's going in life. I don't know anything more damaging than to a man of strong resolve and strong will than one of you women. You got it all figured out until a woman is put into your space. When a woman is put into our space, 
the game changes completely. Because now we got to manage somebody else's emotions. We got to be, you know, conscious about somebody else other than ourselves. And some of us do okay when we by ourselves. But then when you put us in a relationship with somebody, we become a completely different person. You guys follow me? So it's important for us to understand, you know, how being in a relationship is going to change us. Marriage, amongst other things, is considered half of our religion. We hear that often. We hear marriage is part of my deen. We hear brothers and sisters, more so brothers, say all the time in a very cliche manner, um, why you want to get married, brother? Uh, I want to get married because I want to complete half. I want to complete half my deen, right? Not even realizing what that actually even means. I want to complete half my deen. I don't know, for some reason it's not working. Anyway, so marriage is considered half of our religion because of its ability to function as an uh, institution that is a divine institution that will teach man many of the necessary qualities for him to excel and to assume his rightful position as the patriarch of his family. We are going to learn as men in marriage things that we would never learn in any other institution. Marriage is going to teach us things as men. And this is why many of our grandparents got married very early. Not necessarily because they were messing around with each other and the, the social dynamic of that time was that there was no, you know, shacking up and you had to be married. No, they got married early because marriage was going to teach you how to be a man. Because now you have to cater to someone else other than yourself. You have to be responsible for someone other than yourself. And for the woman, it was going to make her responsible because now all of the things that she learned from her mother, she's now going to get a chance to implement that, to practice that. Right? And as a side note, many of our parents got married at 12, 13 years old, right? Right or wrong? So how in the world can you find people that can find fault with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for marrying Aisha, consummating the marriage with Aisha at nine years old? How you find fault with that? When as early as the, the 1976 in Delaware, just the next state over, Delaware in 1976, the, the legal age for marriage in Delaware was 13 years old in 1976. That was just 40 years ago. 13. And we're talking about a man and a whole other culture. And then you find people, well, Muhammad married Aisha at nine years old, married her at six and consummated the marriage with her at nine. That's their cultural dynamic. But here in America, let's just talk about 60 years ago, just here in America, the average age was 12, 13 years old. And although we look at that now and we say that we would never consider doing that now, but at that time it was acceptable. So don't ever let anybody back you into a corner and throw that in your face and say, well, your prophet or Muhammad married a woman at you know, six years old and consummated the marriage with her at nine. Don't let anybody back you into the corner with that. Understand the cultural context here. All right? So that's important. So marriage, amongst other things, is going to teach us you know, things like discipline, teach us like patience, teach us self-control. The like of which we would never learn anywhere else. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned in the hadith that collected in this, uh, the Sunan of Imam Al-Bayhaqi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He said that, um, that if a servant gets married, when a believer gets married, then he has completed half of his religion, so let him fear Allah concerning the other half. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning the other half. Marriage is one half of our religion, meaning one half of our religion is centered around the issues that go on inside of a marriage. Right? And as Dr. Brock said, if marriage is half of our religion, then that means that half of the knowledge that we have should be about marriage. If marriage is half of our religion, then half of the knowledge that we have acquired should be related to marriage. Because it's half of our religion. So everything that we experience, the same challenges and obstacles that we experience in marriage, 
all right, this one particular entity, um, that is half of our religion. And marriage is designed to help us navigate through these things. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, as a man asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, ma akthara ma yudkhil al-nas al-nar. What is the thing that enters most people into the hellfire? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, al-fammu al-farj, your tongue and your private area. And he was asked, what is the thing that enters most people into paradise? He said, what? What is the thing that enters most people into the paradise? What is the thing that causes most people to enter into paradise? Husnul huh? khuluq, good character, and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ promised paradise for the one who could guarantee the control over his private part. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ was so adamant about getting the young men in his uh, community married. Marriage helps to develop the maturity of the man, unlike any other social construct that we know. Tawus, here he was one of the greatest students of Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said, لا يتم نسك الشباب حتى يتزوج. He said, the um, the discipline of a young man will never reach its full capacity, reach its potential until he gets married. We will never know how to discipline ourselves. We don't know patience. We don't know self-discipline, financial discipline, because when we're by ourselves, we don't need to have that level of discipline. The only person we need to be consider, considerate of is ourselves. But when you put a woman, you put children into our lives, now that raises our awareness to another level. All right, so it trains marriage, trains man to control the enemy within. All right, in order to control the enemy without. If you don't have any control here of the enemy here, you're not going to ever be able to control the enemy out there. As Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يُجَاهِدْ نَفْسَهُ أَوَّلًا لِتَفْعَلَ مَا يُؤْمِرَتْ بِي وَتَتْرُكْ مَا نُهِيَتْ عَنْ لَمْ يُمْكِنْهُ يُجَاهِدْ عَدُوَهُ فِي الْخَارِجِ Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said that whoever, the person who does not wage war against himself to condition himself to do what he has been commanded to do and stay away from what he has been commanded to stay away from, he will never be able to wage war against his external enemy. You will never be able to do it. Marriage helps us to develop that internal discipline that if we leave ourselves undisciplined, shaitan will manipulate us and turn us into an animal who gives in to his own impulses and desires. Look at how many people shaitan has turned into an animal. We are just one step as human beings from being animals. As a matter of fact, we are the highest form of animal as human beings. The only difference between us and animals is that we have intellect and they have instinct. When you think about young African American males who grow up in the inner cities of America, they function like animals. Everything is on impulse. Everything is instinct and impulse. No intellect involved. No logic involved. There's street logic, which is actually impulse. It's impulsive. That you do this to me, then I just respond. I don't even think about it, right? Cousin comes around the corner, says, some people jump me, you go grab your gun, you don't even think. You go around the corner, and you shoot everything moving. Kids, nephews, nieces, you don't care. It's impulsive. Shaitan reduces us to animals. When you take logic out of the equation, you are nothing more than an animal. So as human beings, we are the highest form of animals. So when you think about that in terms of lusts, and how we pursue women and how women pursue men today is almost just like animals. You have people who go to work and then go in the bathroom at work and have a quickie in the bathroom and then go back to work. As if like we're animals, like a lion sees a lioness somewhere, goes, satisfies his desire and then keeps it moving. Logic is completely taken out of the equation. And I blame technology for that. Right? This iPhone, iPad, I, 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 I. That makes you narcissistic. It's all about you. You have smartphones, smart TV, smart water, smart this, smart that. Everything's smart but you. 
right? No, serious. The subliminals is there. Everything is smart, but you. Many of us have not even memorized our own cell phone number because we have smartphones. You went to jail tomorrow and you had three numbers to call. Many of us haven't even memorized three numbers in our phone that we can call, including myself. Three numbers because everything else does the math for you. Everything else works for you. Don't think that this stuff is just haphazard. This stuff is put here for a purpose to dumb you down, to make you function at a lower level, a lower frequency of consciousness. Understand that. So in the past, getting married was considered a deficiency in one's manhood. Getting married in the past was considered a deficiency. Like if you didn't get married in the past, you were considered deficient. All right? And the word for integrity is called rujula, or manhood is called rujula. So it was considered a nux, a deficiency in your rujula. While today we live in a culture that celebrates irresponsibility and the freedom from responsibility, whether spousal or parental, right? We have the TV show where the guy says, oh, you're not the father, right? And we rejoice, I'm not the father, yes! Because I don't want to be responsible for this kid. We celebrate irresponsibility. Yes, I'm not the father. Right? The, the most damaging thing for us is to be married to a sister, and then we divorce, and then she says, I'm pregnant. And we're like, dang, I was almost out of that situation. I was almost out of the situation. Now I'm stuck with this situation. Because we live in a culture where we celebrate irresponsibility. TV shows that accentuate buffoonery and applaud the man who is not the father. Even today we have what is called divorce parties where I'm divorced and I'm going to celebrate that I'm no longer married to this person. I'm happy. This is the, one of the greatest days of my life. <laughs> That I'm, 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 you know, that I'm separated from this person. Separated from somebody that you spent some very intimate time of your life that you can never get back. That's not something to be celebrated. That's something that you should frown upon because that was time that you spent with this other human being in your life and you can never get that back. It's not something to celebrate. But this is the culture that we live in. All right? We're spouses who were once, you know, intimate and they celebrated their union are now celebrating their separation from one another independence not from one another but from the institution of marriage when I'm single I no longer have any responsibility to anybody but myself so this is something that is celebrated whereas in the past not being married was considered a nux was considered a deficiency <laughs> Imam Ahmed rahimahullah one of the great scholars of Islam he said about one of his contemporaries, uh, Bishr ibn Hadith. He said, لو كان Bishr ibn Hadith تزوج لتم أمره That if Bishr ibn Hadith had gotten married, he would have been a scholar that, that would have been untouchable. Nobody would have been comparable to him. But the fact that he died and he didn't, he never got married, then that was considered a deficiency in him as a scholar. And it put him amongst the rest of the people because of this matter of not getting married. And another narration, Lamamata ibn Hadith, Bishr ibn Hadith, and another narration when Bishr ibn Hadith got married, Imam Ahmed said, Wallahi, ma lahu nadir fi hadihi al-ummah. He said, I swear by Allah, there's no scholar equal or comparable, comparable to Bishr ibn Hadith. He said, Illa Amir ibn Abdul Qais, fa inna Amir and Mata, walam yatruk shayan, wa hada yani Bishr Mata, walam yatruk shayan, walo tazawaja, kana tamru emmet, kana katama emruhu. He said, There's none comparable to Bishr ibn Hadith except Amir ibn Abdul Qais. He said, Amir ibn Abdul Qais died and didn't leave anything behind, meaning but uh, of knowledge. He said, and so did Bishr ibn Hadith. However, Bishr ibn Hadith, he never got married. And Amr did. So therefore, he is not even comparable to him. 
So the scholars of the past they used to say, La yutraka zawaj ghariban illa ajis or fajr. That none leaves off marriage. None leaves off marriage except someone who was just lazy or someone who was already engaged in some other affair, meaning extramarital or premarital relationships. No one, no young man in the community just decides, nah, I don't want to get married. This was during the time of the scholars of the past, during the time of the Salaf. None, no young man was caught in the community just single. Whereas today, you see a brother, Salaam you married? No, I'm not married. It's like, what are you waiting for? Nah, I'm good on that. You know, I'll come up with some lame excuse about why you don't want to be married. But if you were to dig deep into his life, you find he got a girlfriend. You find he got a couple of girlfriends, a couple of people he's in contact with. As I'm going to share something with you that Steve Harvey shared, and I'm not really a fan of his work, but he said something that actually makes a lot of sense. He said, everybody is doing somebody. Nobody just walking around here single, celibate, not engaged or involved with somebody. Everybody is doing somebody. If you think in this culture, in this society that we live in right here in America as Muslims, that people are just walking around celibate and not engaged with anybody, you sadly mistaken. I used to think that when I first became Muslim. As a new Shahada, you're agreeing to a lot of things in the Muslim community. As a new convert, I couldn't imagine a Muslim being engaged in a relationship with another Muslim. That was something that was unfathomable for me. You know, I had the highest regard for Islam and Muslims because my image of Islam was pretty much picture book. Everything that I believed about Islam was because of something that I read out of a book. And then lo and behold, I was introduced to the Muslim community and I got, you know, <laughs> I got the, the rated R version of Islam. I had a PG Disney fairy tale version of Islam. That's what happens when you accept Islam in prison and all you know is prison Islam. All you know from Islam is what you're reading in books. And then when you go out into the community, you're seeing everybody, you think everybody with a beard is knowledgeable. You think every sister that wears a niqab or wears black is in covers is actually righteous. And then you, you know, you're hit with a different reality and you start to see the community for what it is. And then you realize that we just human beings, man. We just sinners, all of us. And we just trying to be the best sinners that we could possibly be. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Kullu bani Adam khatta'un. All of the children of Adam are sinners And the best of the sinners are those who repent That's all we're trying to be Is the best of the sinners But this whole idea That people are just And I mean there might be a select few But there are exceptions to the rule They're not the rule They're not the rule So as the scholars of the past They used to say لا يترك الزواج غالبا إلا عجز أو فاجر That none leaves off marriage Intentionally Except someone who is عجز He just doesn't have the ability He's lazy Doesn't want to work And go out And do what's necessary To get married Or he's a fajr Or he's someone Who is already disobedient To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Umar bin Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه He ran into a young man And he asked the young man Was he married? And the young man said, no, I'm not married. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, لَمْ يَتَزَوَّجْ قَالَ لَا يَمْنَعُكَ مِنَ الزَّوَاجْ وَمِنَ النِّكَاحْ إِلَّا عَجِزْ أَوْ فُجُورْ Umar asked the young man, is he married? The young man said, no. Umar said, the only reason why you're not married is either because you are too lazy to do what it takes to get married or you already engaged in a relationship. That is haram. Two reasons. So I'm going through all of this first before I get into what has happened to this beautiful institution of marriage. And as you can see, as I keep going, we're going like this. Because we started here talking about the beauty of marriage and how it's just a beautiful institution and what it's designed to do. And how we're slowly working our way down, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the intimacy between man and woman in the Qur'an using the metaphor of a garment. 
Another ayah that we use at many of our nikahs, of many of our marriages, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةُ الصِّيَامَ الرَّفَثُ إِلَى النِسَائِكُمْ هُنَّ لِبَاسُ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسُ لَهُنَّ During the nights of fasting, like after the believers would break their fast, having relations with their wives was still prohibited at the very beginning. When the believers started fasting at the very beginning, it was haram for them to even be intimate with their wives even after they broke their fast. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abrogated that with an ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةُ الصِّيَامَ الرَّفَثُ إِلَى النِّسَاء Now it is permissible for you to be intimate with your wives during the nights of your fasting. Meaning after you break your fast, it is permissible now for you to be intimate with your wives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, حِلُّ لَكُمْ They, your wives, are a garment for you. وَأَنْتُمْ حِلُّ لَكُمْ لَهُنَّ And you are a garment for your wives. Clothing serves a number of purposes. I want you to look at the metaphor. He said, the wives are a clothing for you, and you are a clothing for your wives. Clothing serves a number of purposes. Number one, to clothe, to cover your aura, to cover your private area, to cover your body. Number two, for beautification, for adornment. And number three, for piety and righteousness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libas in yuari so atikum warisha wa libas in taqwa dhalika khayr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O children of Adam, I have sent down for you clothing. So you may cover your bodies. You wadi so atikum. You may cover your bodies in your private parts. Warisha and for beautification. He said, Wali basa taqwa, that it khair. And the clothing of piety and righteousness, that is the best type of clothing. So clothing in this ayah serves three purposes. Number one, to clothe your body, to cover your body. Number two, for beautification and adornment. And three, for piety and righteousness. So when Allah said that your wives are a clothing for you and you are a clothing for them, that means that you are going to help them become righteous and they are going to help you become righteous. This is the institution of marriage. That you are going to aid and assist one another in getting to Jannah. That is the purpose that is the more spiritual purpose. So the institution of marriage is a very critical component in the development of man, both socially as well as spiritually. However, marriage today, marriage today has been turned into an obstacle course. We've turned marriage into an obstacle course. Void of many of the necessary elements that make it the effective system that it was designed to be. How do we turn Islam, how do we turn marriage, and let's, let's just real talk here. How do we turn marriage into the obstacle course that it is today? A bunch of unnecessary ups and downs and twists and turns. How, did, how does that look? How does marriage become so complicated today? Ali radiallahu ta'ala, he said, al-ilm kalima. He said knowledge of Islam was very simple. Ignorant people made it more complicated. <laughs> he said knowledge in Islam is simple. Al-ilm Knowledge is just one word, very simple. Halal, haram, you know, all these things are very simple in our religion. jahilun. Ignorant people have made knowledge more complicated than what it was designed to be from the beginning because ignorant people speak without knowledge and then knowledgeable people have to come behind them and detail the matters that they, you know, complicated and then it ends up making knowledge more complicated than what it was designed to be from the beginning. You follow me? Knowledge is very simple. But then when people who are ignorant come and speak about matters of knowledge and they don't understand what they're talking about, then knowledgeable people have to come behind them and then detail the matters so that people have a more clear understanding and therefore knowledge is more complicated than what it was designed to be. We've done the same thing with marriage. Marriage is supposed to be two people put together in the same space, supposed to feed off of one another, sharpen one another, 
right? And then to get to one another, to get to Jannah. That's very simple. But look at what marriage has become today. Why has marriage become the obstacle course that it is today? I need you guys to engage me. Huh? Fairy tale. The fairy tale of it. Okay, some people come into the marriage institution of marriage with this Disney animation movie depiction of marriage and what, you know, two people being together is supposed to look like. And this, I blame this on our social environment because when we grow up uh, and being raised by single parents, we don't see marriage in the home. So we got to kind of create this image in our mind of what we envision marriage to be like, what it would be like. And then we go into a marriage with somebody and then we realize reality sets in that what you had in your mind of the vision of marriage is not realistic. And then some of us will continue to chase this dream, right? A pipe head, a crackhead chasing a pipe dream. You have a, this vision of marriage in your mind, <clears throat> and every time you enter into a situation and it doesn't match up with the image that you have in your mind, you want out. Then you go into another relationship, and this is not what I have in my mind. I want out. Until eventually you have to wake up and say, maybe it's not all of the marriages that I've been in. Maybe it's the vision of marriage that I have in my mind that is not realistic. You following me? Maybe up here is not realistic. And if you grow up in a single home, you grow up in a single parent raising you in a home, how could you possibly know what a marriage is supposed to look like? And then parents, single parents, sitting their children in front of the TV, you're watching Disney movies all of your life, and by seven, eight years old, you have already concocted in your head what a marriage between a man and a woman is supposed to look like. Millennials. And then when we enter an institution of a relationship between man and a woman and we see that it doesn't match with the vision that I have in my mind, then it must be wrong. I went out. It must be wrong. I went out. It doesn't match with what I have in my mind. And we never question, well, maybe the vision that you have in your mind is wrong. Maybe the relationship you in is right. Maybe the image that you have in your mind that you're trying to match up is wrong. You guys following me? Okay. Why else? Has marriage become complicated? Huh? The roles. Absolutely. There's been a role reversal in our society. Men act like women and women act like men. Absolutely. Facts. Absolutely. Dudes act like chicks and women act like dudes. You have this rise of like this this feminine right this feminist movement right where women are now taking on masculine energy meaning women now begin to take on some of the persona of men you have a masculine energy sisters i want you to evaluate yourself it is not normal for women to be competitive that's not your nature women don't compete with other women that's not your native nature to be competitive. So when you're in a relationship with a man and you're competing with him for who's going to be the man, you have a negative energy, you have a masculine energy that you're carrying with you. And a lot of times that comes from your mothers. Some of these mothers are very bitter, lonely women, have been bitter, lonely women for many years. And you live vicariously through your daughters. Oh, he said what? You better tell him. He better not do this. Or he better not do that. You my baby girl. Bye, 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 bye. You're living vicariously through your daughter. And you're spewing this negative energy onto your daughter who, you know, unfortunately is embracing and absorbing. We like sponges. We just absorb everything. Right? My mom, she was a single mother. She raised me by herself. She obviously got the answers. So when mom comes and says, hey, listen, your husband better be treating you right. How's he treating you? Well, you know, this and that. Well, you better tell him to do this. And you. And sometimes as men, we can hear our wives talking to us, but it ain't our wives. It's their mothers. Right or wrong? I know some of your mother-in-laws might be in here now. You, you know what I mean? I ain't scared. I, 
I, I ain't got to go home, right? <laughs> I'm good. Now, nah, even if I had to go home, like, I, I mean, listen, real talk. I am understand something. I'm cut from a different cloth. I am a man. I don't cower in front of no woman. I'm sorry. That doesn't mean that I don't respect women. I have nothing but the utmost respect for women. But I am not a coward in front of women. I speak my piece. You know, you may not like it, but you will respect me for saying my piece. And sometimes, you know, we, you, that's, that's the, the role that we have to play. Society has put all of these different obstacles in front of us as men. You, you can't say anything about a person being gay because then that makes you homophobic. You can't say anything about a woman having masculine energy because then that makes you anti-women. You know, nah, nah, miss me with all of that, man. I don't play by those rules. My rules are Quran and Sunnah. Allah said, God said, and his messenger said, those are my rules. Those are the rules that I play by. Oh, so what you trying to say, gay people going to hell? What did God say? Whatever God said, that's what I say. Did God say they going to hell? Don't ever think that you're going to back me in a corner like that. What did God say? Did God say they going to hell? Are they cursed in the Bible? The Old Testament, New Testament, the Quran, the Torah, the Injil. Name one book they're not cursed in. Give me one book where God condoned that. So, you know, the role reversal, absolutely, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prophesized that there would be a role reversal. See, some of these hadith about the last day, we don't pay attention to them. We're not looking at them through our cultural context. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that perhaps there's going to come a time where men will resemble women and women will resemble men. Did he not prophesize that? Is that not an authentic hadith? That there will come a time where women will resemble men and men will resemble women. When we read those hadith, we're usually looking at the thing that usually comes to our minds in terms of dress. But you don't wear dress except that it's connected to who you are on the inside. We already talked about clothing and the importance of clothing and the purpose that clothing serves. Clothing is not just some article that you put on you. What you wear is who you are. A man that puts on women's clothing is not a man in my eyes. I'm sorry. I no longer see you. As the Arabs, they have a saying, Sakata min aini. You fell from my eye, meaning I don't even see you anymore. I don't even see you anymore. And then you have these same men that dress like women, but they're with women. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. If a woman has now embraced masculine energy, uh, especially African Americans, because we kind of take movements and we just run with them. Feminist movement didn't even start with us, but it's our movement now, right? LGBT community didn't start with us. That movement didn't start with us, but we're taking the reins, right? We take every movement, even though it didn't start with us, and we make it our own. Constantly looking for validation, man. But you take a man who wears skinny jeans, right? Skinny jeans. I ain't talking about slim cut jeans. Some people like their jeans to fit them a certain way, including myself. I'm not talking about slim or straight jeans. I'm talking about skinny jeans. Where the jeans fit you like spandex. Meaning if you and your girl, you and your wife were walking down the street and we were seeing you both from the back, we wouldn't know which one is the male and which one is the female. When you take a man that dresses like that, when he goes home to this woman that he shares the same space with, how do you think she embraces him? Does she embrace him like a man who you know, is a man's man, does she embrace him like that? Absolutely not. He's usually the one washing the dishes. He's usually the one that's at home and cleaning up the home and things like that. He's usually the one that, you know, under the guise of having respect for his woman. But in fact, the roles have been reversed and you don't even realize it. You don't even realize it. There's no woman that can look a man in his face and accept the fact, and maybe I'm speaking from a different cultural perspective. 
Maybe in today's society, 2017, maybe some women are okay with that. And they see these men as being men. But I, I grew up in the 80s. So anybody who grew up in my era, there's no way that you're going to embrace that as, as being the new normal. That will never be the new normal. So these are just some of the reasons why marriage has, has become you know, an obstacle course. As we said, the role reversal, very serious. Um, people coming into marriage with their own fairy tale understanding of marriage. What else? I heard from the brothers, from the sisters' perspective. Why has marriage have become such an obstacle course today? Why did come sit down? Okay. Point taken. She said that we grow. Somebody just mentioned something on Periscope. He said that we are afraid to take risks. That's deep. I'll come back to that. She said that one of the reasons is that we come into marriage uneducated about marriage. I mean, it's oxymoronic. You're going into the institution of marriage and you're ignorant of marriage. You're a walking contradiction. Even as it relates to, you know, things that are to take place, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu after you marry the woman, the, the first night, before consummation, there's dua that you should make, there's certain things the Prophet Sallallahu instructed us to do, and all of this is garnering that barakah that we're looking for that will contribute to the longevity of our marriages. But we go in, we marry, we feed the people, and then off we go on our honeymoon, Right? Resembling the non-Muslims, we don't no Sunnah practices going on whatsoever. And you know, the Prophet used to he instructed us to grab the forelock of the woman, and to ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to give me the good of this woman, and to seek refuge in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from anything that might be evil in that woman. The Prophet ﷺ instructed us to make a certain du'a, instructed the believers to make du'a for the person. We say, "Oh, congratulations." That, that's not the dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to make for the person when they get married. And all of those things are important. Those things are important. But, you know, we tend not to put emphasis on these things or because we're just completely ignorant of them. All right? So people go into marriage ignorant of marriage. Not even understanding. You know how many people have been married without a marriage contract? People sitting right now. Guarantee you in this room right now is somebody married right now without a marriage contract. Guarantee you. And the marriage contract is one of the conditions for the validity of a marriage. Muslims marry without a wali. Oh, my friend's husband was my wali. That wasn't your wali, I'm sorry. According to Islamic legislation, you might not even be married. Which means your children might not even be legitimate. I mean, there's so many other repercussions that happen as a result of that. Things that we take for granted, things that are just loose. We just loose with these things. And it's just like we just move in the community like it's everything is all good. And it's not all good. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislate a system to be practiced a certain way? And then here comes a generation of people who claim to be Muslims, who claim to follow the sunnah, but doing it the exact opposite of the way that Allah legislated for it to be done. And then hope for some barakah from Allah in it. Not going to happen. When you give your children instructions to do something, you want them to do it exactly the way that you told them to do it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us instructions to carry out his religion, he wants us to do it exactly the way that he instructed us to do it. And then sent us a messenger to demonstrate how it should be done. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how many times did he get married in the community and each and every one of his marriages were documented? Documented. And then we still turn around and conduct ourselves in the most improper manner, un-Islamic manner when it comes to marriage. And then we wonder why we have no barakah in our marriages. Allah legislated marriage. He sent his prophet who got married multiple times in the community. And each and every one of his marriages were documented. Authentic narrations. Documented. Most of the time by his wives. 
His wives are giving us narrations of the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ, even though it didn't include them. Many of us, when we take second wives, our wives don't even know that we got married, let alone can testify to the fact that we married the woman. I mean, just think about this stuff, man. Think about this. Each and every one of his marriages was done publicly. And you have people who say, well, it's not an obligation on you to tell your wife when you're about to get married. What sense does that make? That might work in another culture. That does not work in our culture. And transparency builds trust. If you can't marry a woman, and I mean, I personally don't know any woman who would be willing to marry a man and his other part of his family doesn't know about it. How are you okay with that? How is one ever okay with something like that? And do you think when you finally break it to your wife, she's going to accept that in the most positive way? You might still be in monogamy because when you tell her, she went out. So you're not even in polygyny, self-defeating behavior, hustling backwards. Polygyny is to have more than one, not to do it in a manner where you only end up with one. Real talk, facts, man. Facts. And your wife might be in her feelings, but she will have nothing but the utmost respect for you for coming to her and saying, this is what I choose to do. I'm not asking you for your permission. I'm telling you that this is what I'm going to do. May not happen today, may not happen tomorrow, whatever the case may be. Well, I want out the moment you decide to do that. Well, we can discuss that when we cross that bridge when we get there. I'm just letting you know how it's going to happen. She may not like you, but she will have nothing but the utmost respect for you. But you go around the corner and you do it that way, nobody's going to, nobody. Nobody has any loyalty anymore. That's a whole other issue. Loyalty to the marriage, not loyalty to the other person. My loyalty is to my institution, the marriage that I married into. So the institution of marriage is a critical component to the development of man. However, marriage today has been turned into an obstacle course, void of many of the necessary elements that make it the effective system that it was designed to be. Many people have exploited marriage for their own personal gain. Exploitation of marriage. We're now using marriage to get from the other person what we need. Exploitation. Meaning, you go into the marriage to get what you want from the marriage, not caring or being concerned about what the other person wants. That's called exploitation. Where you exploit, right? Benefiting from the many perks of the institution of marriage, such as halal sex. I don't really want to be married, but being single is a fitna for me because I can't be intimate with anybody. And the only way that I can be intimate with somebody is if I'm married to them. So I'm going to get married just so I can have halal sex. I don't really care about the institution of marriage. I don't care about the whole marital experience. That really doesn't matter to me. I just want what I want from the situation, and that is halal sex. I was in Canada, and I was having a discussion, and I had a young sister, man, subhanAllah. She said to me, how could I say that there's something wrong with halal sex? She said, many brothers don't want to be married anyway, so the only thing you get from the marriage is sex. Meaning brothers are marrying into this institution of marriage, but they don't want the whole marital experience. All they want from the marriage is sex. I said to the sister, I said, but how could you be okay with that? That you're marrying into the institution of marriage just to give a man what he wants. For, what about what you want from the marriage? Do you want halal sex? If that's not what you want, why you keep selling yourself short, marrying into these marriages just for halal sex? Absolutely. Financial stability. Some people go in because they see the other person is financially stable and I need some stability in my life. I need financial stability. I'm going, I'm falling on hard times and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. When does it become a problem? It's when you marry into that and you don't tell the other person that that's what you're in it for. No transparency. See, when you tell a person straight up, this is why I'm coming into this marriage, 
you give the person the opportunity to say, well, that's not why I'm coming into this marriage. You might want to find somebody else. You don't trick the person into marrying you for reasons that are solely connected to your agenda and not our agenda. You follow me? It's called deception. It's deception. It's haram to deceive your brother or your sister in Islam. To go in and say, hey, listen, I'm falling on hard times. I'm not going to lie to you, right? As they say in Philly, I ain't going to hold you. You know what I mean? I'm marrying you because, you know, I, I want to be married, but I'm also, I also need some financial stability in my life. And you have some men that's okay with that. I'm here to provide for you. I got you. Some men are okay with that, but they know ahead of time why she, the, one of the reasons that the main reasons that she's in it. The Prophet said, That a woman is married for four reasons for her wealth, for her beauty, for her social status. He said, But choose the woman that has deen, and may you never experience humiliation. So, marrying a woman, or vice versa, a woman marrying a man for money or marrying for financial stability, there's nothing wrong with that Islamically. When does it become a problem? When we marry and we don't tell the person. We're not transparent with the person about why we are here. Why am I in this making sign in this contract to be a part of your life? Right? So we exploit marriage for halal sex, financial stability, personal validation. Right? We ain't never been validated in our lives. Some of us, if we were non-Muslims, we probably at 30, 40, 50 years old, we still wouldn't be married. We come into Islam, we see that this is what's the, the order the order operations, marriage is on the table, and now we're getting married. And we get married because we're looking for that validation. We marry into a marriage with this person, and we're going to suck this person dry. As John, um, John Gray, I believe his name is, um, he used the metaphor of sticking a straw into someone and sucking the life out of them. So you have people who marry into, go into marriage, and they're very insecure. And they're going to suck the other person dry until they can build themselves up, so they can validate themselves, so they can feel secure. So as a man, it's a lot of times this is the woman's plight, but there's some men that are insecure as well. And they marry for, you know, personal security, validation as well. But for the woman, it's like, you know, we suck the man dry. How do I look? You know, always the, the whole relationship is centered around you because you need validation. So you're going to use me for the duration of our marriage to suck me dry so you can get what you need from this relationship. And here again, there's nothing wrong with you needing validation, but just be transparent with the person up front. Say, hey, listen, you know, I've been in a couple of marriages in the past, you know, and they've stolen some things from me, right? And I need validation. And then the person can say, hey, listen, I got you. Or the person can say, you know what? I need validation too. I'm not the guy for you. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you go into a marriage, silent expectations don't get met. And perhaps you tell the person this is what you need and then the person can tell you well, I'm not the person that can give that to you because I need it too. Faqidu shayla, you're a tea. Someone who doesn't have something can't give you what they don't have. <laughs> now, so we'll pause here for the Adan, inshallah. We'll continue after the Salah, inshallah.